This program raises questions. This program is for people who find it hard to trust God. The best answers are wrapped in flesh and blood. My friends, people who are enduring real tragedies every single day. Quadriplegia, muscular dystrophy, stroke, bankruptcy, loneliness, singleness. We're gonna to talk to those very people who have touched my life. It was Sunday, November 5th, 2006. I was excited because my dad was preaching that night and it was amazing that all of this was happening the same night and Jen was singing in the choir. And so it was, a, it was an exciting day. Josh and I, we were playing in a baseball tournament. Um, we actually won the championship that weekend. I was praying that Andy and Josh would make it back in time because I knew that'd be very important for her that her dad would see her in the choir concert. Andy and I coached together. Our two boys, uh, Josh, Merrick, and Zach Clinton, our two boys were on the team. We had a great afternoon. We were, we were really trying to get home in time because um, Jen and my daughter Megan were both involved in, um, it was a choir, a Sunday night choir service. I remember getting to church early, Jen had to be there early, and I started saving the whole second row because Andy's parents were there, my parents were going to be there, and a lot of friends, and it was exciting to have all our friends and family there. And it was beautiful. Later that evening, we had no idea what was going to happen. 433. Well, I got a head-on collision with another vehicle. I need rescue of fire here now. Well, I got two adults and two juveniles, major injuries. Copy, 433. The Barrick family of middle-class Lynchburg, Virginia, had never known real tragedy. On November 5th, 2006, however, that changed. While driving home from a choir concert at church, they were struck head on by a drunk driver going 80 miles per hour. Well, in that split second, their world would be forever altered. What does the average successful happy family do when, when catastrophe strikes without a moment's notice? There's no script, there's no formula or blueprint for it. But disguised within this particular tragedy is a story that is heartbreakingly wonderful, even miraculous. But um, first, let's trace the details. Jen's grandfather, Dr. Heinzen, was speaking that night. But more importantly, Jen was singing in the high school choir. They were singing the song about the names of God. And uh, it was one of those stand up to your feet type songs. Jennifer was in the choir for the very first time, and this was her first choir concert, so she was so excited. I remember video and Jennifer too as she sang and she was radiating so much and it was unbelievable to watch her and I felt so proud as a mom just watching her praise the Lord and excited. Everything in her life was going perfectly. Jen was so excited about singing in the concert because she loved singing this song, this new song that she had learned, Lord You're Holy. And I'll never forget, Jen is smiling and praising the Lord, and all of a sudden, Megan smiles at one point. And I think Jen squeezed her hand right at her favorite part where it says, you are my healer, deliverer, shield, and defense, strong tower, and my best friend. And um, it wasn't just a song to her. She was having the time of her life, praising her Lord. There aren't words to describe. When I think back, it's so hard because she had no idea what the rest of that night was, what was going to happen. Uh, 
we invited some friends over for a party at the house uh, to watch a football game. We were going up Waterlick Road and we were less than a mile from our home. It's a long, straight, narrow road that leads to our house and we traveled it, I don't know, a couple times a day. A drunk driver hits a car prior to slamming into the barracks vehicle. A call is placed to 911 by the victim sitting in that first car. Yeah, well, 911. You've been hit by a truck. This guy has stopped at the stoplight and he sat through two green lights already. Okay, what's he doing now? He's either ducked down or passed out in the driver's seat of his truck. Yeah, I see the I see the Bedford County officer. Okay. Okay, the, the guy in the truck is getting out. All right, so he's talking to the deputy now? Yes. Okay. The guy's out of the truck. And the drunk driver um, who had been interrogated by police was put back in the vehicle, keys in hand, started up his truck. He had already hit someone that evening, and he took off um, coming directly towards us with his lights off. Somehow the drunk driver got back in his car, drove off, and the police followed in hot pursuit. That's when the drunk driver slammed into the Barrett family. Copy four thirty three. Man, well, I got uh, one juvenile female unresponsive. Uh, two adult females, major injuries to the head, and one male juvenile. He's got minor injuries. The driver of the truck that was in pursuit. My name is the local him at this time. 10-4, we're getting you some help out there now. Everything went blank from there, you know. I remember waking up to this awful smell. It was like the smell of blood and burnt rubber. I mean, it was just terrible. I remember waking up and my face is completely crushed up against the windshield. It, the metal actually came like inches away from my mom and my dad. She said it was, it was like angels had wrapped their bodies around my mom and my dad and had to protect them because there's no other way of explaining it. And I can't really move. And I'm saying out loud, is this a dream or is this real? And I remember looking at her and the whole left side of her face was just covered in blood, just totally drenched. And um, I remember my mom was saying, is this real or is this a dream? And I remember saying, yes, mom, this is real. Um, Andy's, Andy starts to wake up and he's praying out loud too, but I think he's in shock. He's not really answering my questions, but we're both just praying out loud. Josh is praying with me. I just remember saying like, Lord, I don't know. I really don't know what just happened. And, um, and I just pray, Lord, that you'll keep us safe, Lord, and that you'll be with Jen, and she hasn't w woken up yet, as Jen was to the left of me, and she was just kind of like laying limp over her seatbelt. Uh, he hit us with such force that he dropped the engine out of his truck and literally ran over top of our van. There was debris everywhere. We were just running over crunch, you know, just, just car debris, glass, um, just anything you can imagine was there, was there at that point. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the worst, this accident looked like a 10. And it was like a, a chaotic situation. The people that were in, you know, were in command of that time were trying to get everything under control, but it was such a bad accident that people were just trying to find the victims of the accident and their actual cars. I had headed down into an embankment where I believed that there was some activity and needed some help. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw Josh. I saw this woman I know, her name was Christy Van, and um, she recognized me right away and she was like, Josh, are you okay? I was like, yes, I'm all right. And I said, Josh, who's with you? And he said, my family. And he pointed down this way. And so I ran down to the embankment. I, um, I got into the car. I reached across to Jen and she was hanging by her seatbelt, um, just, just hanging there and very, very bloody, very graphic. Um, the firefighter reached in and cut her seatbelt. Um, and when, when he did, I had her in my arms and I laid her across my, my um, lap here. And when I looked down at Jen, um, I honestly thought Linda and Andy had lost their baby. 
We were told that Jen probably was being light flighted to UVA. It was really uncertain as to whether or not she was going to survive the trip. That night when it all happened, I just remember I got to go back there with Linda, you know, and you could tell they were stitching up her head um, with no plastic surgeon standing there. They were just stitching her up and so much of her was broken. This whole like left side was just crushed and broken and she had so much glass everywhere and I was trying to pick it out of her mouth and in between she's talking to me and um, I just remember um, having to step out behind the curtain and Tim Clinton he, um, a friend, he came out and he said, if you want to see Jennifer alive, you have to go to Charlottesville because she's not going to make it. I just had, you know, real sadness for Jennifer. And because, um, you know, as a father, you know, uh, you know, she, she didn't do anything, you know. And as a father, I would have done anything to keep this from happening happening but um, at the same time I was I was angry and I had to give that to the Lord I had to really I remember just being so mm, you know angry at the beginning at a person why would a person why would this happen why would a person do this and um, but little by little I realized you know I mean we it could have been me you know, without Christ. The shock of the accident has passed, and now Andy and Linda must pull together the pieces. Despite his anger, which is completely understandable, Andy releases the bitterness. Indeed, without Christ, he could have been that driver who was drunk. But there's hardly time to think about it, for they've got a long way to go especially Jennifer. They transferred me to UVA, and that's really when I, after my accident on Friday, I realized, you know, we're in, you know, it was pretty, pretty significant. And they transferred me to be with Jennifer at UVA. And so, and Linda was still in Lynchburg, and Josh, by this time, it was out of the Roanoke. I wanted to see Jennifer when I got up there. Um, and I kept demanding, but they wouldn't let me see her. When we're finally able to see Jennifer, the room is small, and Andy and I can hardly fit our wheelchairs, both of us, in there. <clears throat> that was a very, very emotional time. You know, for the first time you're wheeled into a room and, you know, you just realize how, where you're at, um, where your daughter's at, you know. It was just hard seeing Jennifer with all the tubes and the bolt in her head and just covered in, <clears throat> you know, the blankets to keep her body temperature down. and. It's just a nightmare. I don't think you can be prepared at all. Um, I was nervous walking in. I could feel my heart racing, um, the anticipation. I couldn't wait to get there to see her. But then once I opened the door and the closer I got to the bed, it was like a cage. At some point she had to start, they had to try to get her to start doing some things. But emerging from a coma is, you just don't, wake up and you're there. I mean, she, it started with the crack of an eye. Um, Jen would moan a lot and thrash and I would rub her feet and legs for hours just trying to give her some comfort. Jen's teacher while at Kluge was Penny and she was awesome. And she had actually heard about our car wreck on the radio and had prayed for Jen before she ever met her. I think the thing that was unusual about this situation, and, and as um, staff people, we always talk to the parents about when children are emerging from coma, they may say things that they've never said before. They may have a personality that's different than they, you know, we kind of warn the families, be prepared for agitation, be prepared for aggression. That never happened. That never happened with Jen. Um, she never said any, any 
mean words, horrible words, you know, she didn't demonstrate frustration other than physically moving around and being uncomfortable and things like that. There were times in the classroom where I'd be asking her to read things or look at things, she couldn't see them. She'd try again, she'd try harder. I mean, she never, the, the level of frustration that should have been there wasn't there. And you know, we're expecting her to be cussing and screaming and confusion. Many kids on that hallway are screaming in confusion. And Jennifer was definitely moaning in pain. She was very agitated. Um, it's the worst thing, other than losing a child, it's probably the worst thing you can ever experience as a parent. So we just had to face where we were at at the time. You know, I mean, what do you do? I mean, you pray to God, say, God, you know, I know you're sovereign, I don't understand it. That's my little girl laying there, she did nothing. She's clinging to life, but you're sovereign. And so we just went back and tried to remember all the things that we had known and hidden in our heart that God will not fail us or forsake us. Already we're seeing a miracle happening in Jennifer's life, brain injured, in a coma, and yet there's no lashing out, no profanity, no anger normally associated with someone who's coming up out of a coma. That is so unusual. And as Andy just shared, it's becoming obvious God is in control. Yet you gotta wonder, how much, if anything, will Jennifer recover? More than a month in a coma is a long, long time. Eventually she started doing some therapy and that was hard to watch. Um, her body had, you know, her muscles had gone through great atrophy. Um, she had to relearn how to stand again. It was very hard for her. Um, she could only stand for a second. Then it moved into where I remember they tried to take her out of the bed with a crane and stand her and they strapped her to a board and she just collapsed and um, you know we'd take her out and put her in a wheelchair she couldn't stand and put her in a wheelchair and wheel her around but one thing she never lost or was scripture and and, and words praise music songs it was just hidden in her heart because she was at the uh, at the stage of emerging from coma that she was that she wasn't worried about all the worldly things or even thinking about or aware of all the worldly things that we all are always aware of. It's that her level of consciousness was totally spiritual, especially in the beginning stages when she first awoke. We would open up the Bible and start reading scripture and she could quote along with us wherever we were. And again, she had stored up God's Word in her heart, and God was allowing her to remember what she read. And I remember a couple of Linda's friends, you know, um, would read the Bible to Jennifer at night, and she couldn't speak, but she'd mouth it right with them. She knew every passage. Those ladies were forever changed by that. Uh, she may have forgotten some math, she may have forgotten history, she may have forgotten people or things that happened when she was growing up, but she, the Word is alive. You don't lose it no matter what happens, you know, she, she still had that throughout. For kids to, to um, kind of come awake this way, they'll be able to talk when they're not thinking about it or mumble when they're not thinking about it, but if you ask them directly, they cannot do it. And so a lot of times she'd be lying in bed just repeating scripture or um, singing praise songs, not singing them out loud, but just mumbling them or mouthing them. But then if you would ask her directly something that was related to something else, she wouldn't be able to use her voice. It's hard to explain what we were experiencing emotionally because on one hand, we're so excited that Jen is praising the Lord. And on the other hand, we're watching her as she's wheeled to therapy and they're handing her a shoe and she'll say, what is it? She doesn't know what it is. They hand her a toothbrush and she says, what is it? What do I do with it? And um, she doesn't know anything. And yet she knows her Lord and her Savior. Great job. Isn't that awesome?
Well, as she was emerging and getting stronger and doing more things, um, Jen still couldn't see, you know, um, she didn't speak that much. She just really knew us by our voice, but we would play songs and one of them was Lord You Are Holy, the song that she sung the night of the, um, the wreck. And she just became so happy, you know, um, joyful, I would say, when we'd sing that song. And she just mouth the words. And, you know, I just, it just brought her comfort. She still praised the Lord, even though she couldn't see, she couldn't really speak, but she knew. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Those words meant so much to her. It was incredible. So we would sing it over and over and over. We started singing Christmas carols and um, we're just singing, and Jennifer started singing different little words. Um, she wouldn't remember every word, but she remembered some. And all of a sudden, um, you just saw Jennifer's face. It was like a beam of light. It was just, she started smiling, just almost like she didn't even see us sitting there anymore. And she was smiling, and Linda was on one side of her, and I was down kneeling at the other, rubbing her leg as we were singing. and. I just remember um, all of a sudden we were singing um, Silent Night and Linda, we just stopped and Linda said, Jennifer, Jennifer, what do you see? Because you could just tell she was there but not there and Jennifer said, it's Jesus, don't you see? He's right here and I think we cried all day. And Jennifer was, she was just talking to the Lord and she was saying how indescribable he was. And then she was asking him, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to stay? Or do you want me to go? What would you have me to do? For her to be in his presence, to see him, because I just believe she was right there with him. He was right there and Jennifer saw him. She didn't see us. She didn't know who we were. She didn't talk to us. But here she was talking to him and it sounded like her. When we got noises from her that didn't sound like Jennifer, it sounded like somebody else. I just, um, I lift you up and thank you and praise you. Thank you for everything you're doing in my life. I just want to praise you for all the people I've been able to influence and I just pray that your will be done there. As she sings and talks to God and prays God like He's right there, and so much we forget about that, that the Lord's always right next to us. We think He's so far off. Penny said one day to her, why are you at this place? And she said, to sh they wanted her to say, you know, I've been in a wreck because they're trying to help her short-term memory. And so they asked her, why are you here? And Jennifer said, to share my testimony. People's lives were affected in such a positive way, even mine, Linda's, and Josh. But it was a bad time that you, as a, you don't like to go back and remember. But through it, God used Jen, even when she couldn't even speak. Yeah, that was quite a, an emotional time where we just hugged, cried, and um, prayed, and tried to support.
I'll never forget the day that I'm sitting next to her bed in the wheelchair and she's praying out loud, Father, thank you for healing me and raising me up. And she can't even sit up. She doesn't even know she's hurt. And she's praising him in advance for what he's going to do. And I believe God was ministering to us through Jen. One day she even looked at me and said, God knows what spiritual path you're on at all times. Will he be confident with you? Will you hold up easily under this test? And I remember thinking, test? What do you mean this is a test? I had no idea we were, I had no idea we were in a test. And there's the miracle. Jennifer is physically but a shadow of her former self, but spiritually, she is towering above those around her. All because this teenager spent years hiding God's word in her heart, hiding the words to hymns, memorizing praise courses, scriptures. And when you do that, you are memorizing God's thought patterns. You're learning to think like God. <laughs> well, no wonder Jennifer exudes the life of Christ. She has, as 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says, the mind of Christ. And that can see a person through the toughest of trials. But Jennifer's story is not over. She may be soaring spiritually, but physically? Well, this kid's still pretty disabled. Will she recover? <laughs> that is another story. So join me next time as we watch God's mysterious plan unfold for this remarkable young woman. 